Yosemite National Park isn't just full of beauty and visitors, it's also a place full of mysteries. Millions pass through its gates every single year. On your next visit to the park or any national park, there's a list rangers want you to be aware of. It's a list of people who entered the park but never left. Yosemite National Park is reopening today after being closed for nearly three weeks following safety concerns for tourists. Every year, hundreds of people are reported missing in national parks and forests. And most are eventually found, whether dead or alive. But a small percentage of the cases are never solved. Yosemite National Park is located in California, nestled in the heart of the Sierra Nevada Mountains. It was established under federal protection in 1864 and became a part of the United States National Park Service on October 1, 1890. Today, the park spans more than 740,000 acres of land and is most well known for its majestic waterfalls, striking sunsets, and diverse outdoor pursuits that altogether draw more than 4 million visitors annually. Yosemite's natural ecosystem supports more than 400 species of wildlife including black bear, coyote, and the elusive mountain lion, and its forests are populated by some of the oldest and largest species of trees. The ancient giant sequoias are the most recognizable big trees of Yosemite, but we can't overlook the sugar pine, especially when it casually drops 24-inch pine cones to the forest floor from heights of over 200 feet. These huge pine cones, dense vegetation, Imposing granite mountains and cascading waterfalls make for a truly remarkable wonderland of natural beauty. Along with the beautiful surroundings and fun outdoor adventures, Yosemite is burdened with an unfortunate dark side. Mysterious, inexplicable things happen here, and there are a disturbing number of unsolved disappearances from the area, some of which have gone unsolved for decades. Could there be some truth to Yosemite's legends and lore? With so many annual visitors and its harsh terrain, a few missing people wouldn't seem uncommon. But the number of disappearances at Yosemite and within the national park system overall is beyond unsettling. In this video, we'll cover strange events, local legends, and five unsolved missing person mysteries from Yosemite National Park, plus a bonus case at the very end. The following events, legends, and disappearances can be frightening so viewer and listener discretion is advised. Strange events at Yosemite. Deadly lightning. Former Yosemite park ranger John W. Bingaman wrote about several strange events he recalls happening at the park in his 1961 publication titled Guardians of the Yosemite. He begins by saying, the ranger files of strange accidents through the years reads like a storybook fiction. The first strange event he covered was about a freak lightning storm. He wrote, One day, a severe lightning storm came up suddenly over Glacier Point when 30 horseback riders were on their way up to the point. Lightning struck near the party, and a bolt of fire ran down the trail, killing nine saddle horses. The riders, fortunately, were not injured, only shocked by the charge of lightning so close to them and having their horses killed. No one in the party will ever forget that experience. It's worth noting that the chances of lightning striking so many living beings at once are exceptionally rare, yet this isn't the only time a freak lightning storm has showed up at Yosemite and turned out deadly. In 1985, around 6.30 p.m., five climbers had made their way up to Half Dome overlooking Yosemite Valley and were sitting on top of a cavern. Then, out of nowhere, lightning struck the group, killing two of them and injuring the other three, two of them critically. The lightning bolt sent one of the climbers tumbling down 4,000 feet. 16-year-old Brian Gordon was one of the two who passed from fatal injuries, though the identity of the second person who died was withheld until relatives were notified of the incident. 28-year-old Tom Rice and 24-year-old Bruce Weiner were hospitalized at UC Davis Medical Center and were in critical condition from the lightning storm. 22-year-old Adrian J. Esteban was treated at the medical center and released the same day. This event led the National Park Service to issue safety guidelines on how to identify and avoid lightning and thunderstorms at Yosemite. Strange Animal Encounters Another set of strange events recounted in Guardians of the Yosemite by John are a couple reports of odd coyote behavior. Here is another unusual happening, he wrote. 
Jeffrey Stanton of Walnut Creek, California, was camping in the Wawona campground. Sometime during the early morning hours, a coyote bit him on the head while he was asleep. He awakened in time to see the coyote try to weigh into the bushes. First aid was given and, in addition, the necessary treatment for rabies at Lewis Memorial Hospital. An extensive hunt by the rangers was made for a week, but the coyote was never located and, fortunately, Mr. Stanton suffered no ill effects from the experience. A similar case happened a month later when Carl M. Munson of Yosemite was camping in the Wawona campground. A coyote or wild dog scratched him on the head while he was sleeping on the ground. Here, again, no bad reactions occurred from the experience, but the rangers hunted for days with no results again. It was assumed that the animal was hunting for its food and passed by Carl when he turned or moved in his sleeping bag. The animal may have thought it was something to pounce on, as they often do when searching for small game or birds. John ended the section on strange events. He recalled by saying, These specific accidents are just a few of the many that are reported and treated by rangers as part of a full day's work. UFO Sighting On September 19, 2002, during evening hours and just after the sun had set, those at Yosemite were treated to an unexpected visitor, a bright ball-shaped light in the sky. Although classified as a UFO, the ball of light was surrounded by another halo of light much larger than itself and was trailed by seemingly miles of zigzag smoke. The ball of light made its way across the sky slowly, and a visitor was able to capture the event on camera before the disc, or whatever it was, ultimately disappeared into the night. About 30 minutes after the flying disc went away, the witness writes that Air Force jets arrived and circled the area multiple times. Nothing unusual was reported. Numerous other incidents like this have happened at Yosemite, and to this day, we don't know for sure what these strange aerial visitors were. The UFO footage captured that evening in 2002 was regarded as some of the best available for that time. Considering that lightweight camcorders weren't really around and popular until the 1990s, and phone camera recording wasn't around in the U.S. until the early 2000s, it's no surprise. And yet, it seems as though little to no real investigation is being done, or perhaps there's no investigation being publicized, to solve these UFO sightings by identifying what they are, where they originated, and why they appear in the skies over Yosemite. Yosemite Legends How are centuries-old tales and legends still around in today's time? It's tempting to think humans should have grown beyond the fear of things that go bump in the night. But despite our current scientific knowledge and advanced technology, some of the most unsettling mysteries we face still go unsolved. Perhaps there's more to the olden tales than meets the eye. Here are just a few of the many legends originating from the Yosemite area. The Fish Women, a Miwok folk tale. It is said that thousands of years ago, when the Awanachis were still a young nation, the Merced River was the home of the fish women, or mermaids. The mermaids were beautiful creatures having the tails of fish, complete with scales and fins, and the upper bodies of gorgeous women. They were unable to leave the water, but would often sit upon the rocks in the shallows, watching, combing their long black hair with knowing hands, chanting their most alluring of songs to the warriors of Awani. Charming as the mermaids were, the warriors were not easily fooled, and they knew the mermaids were beautiful but sinister. One day, there were two braves out fishing in the deep river pools using a net fashioned with milkweed thread. The net became entangled in the rocks at the bottom of the river, so one of the braves dove down to free the netting. This turned out to be an opportunity the fish women couldn't resist. Once the brave was under the water's surface, the fish women darted out from under the rocks. They tied the threads of the net to his toes and held him underwater until he drowned. Then they untied the brave and carried him away to their hidden land beneath the river, and neither the brave nor the mermaids were ever seen again. The Pohono Legend the Miwok Pohono legend holds that Yosemite's Bridal Veil Falls is haunted by an ancient evil spirit that manifests in the form of an alluring and captivating wind. The story is told of an older woman and a maiden of Awani who were picking berries along the stream above Bridal Veil Fall, when something evil happened. As the two were vying for the ripest berries, the maiden looked away from her work, down the stream and out toward the brink of the waterfall, 
where she saw a multicolored mist swirling high into the air. The maiden was charmed by the beauty of the colors and enchanted by the presence of the mist and the energy it carried. She became further hypnotized until she finally abandoned her hunt for berries altogether and moved down the stream, closer to the swirling colors and closer to the edge of the falls. Nothing could turn her attention away from the mist, not the older woman calling to her in the background, not even her own self-preservation as she was lured closer to the drop-off. She was focused only on the intoxicating, colorful cloud of mist and wind. As the maiden took her last few steps toward the brink of the falls, the whirling winds let out a shriek of unholy glee and engulfed her completely. The evil spirit used the winds to carry the maiden's body up and throw her over the ledge of the falls. Kohono watched as the maiden plunged to her rocky death below. The older woman was terrified by what she had just watched unfold. She quickly made her way down the cliff, navigating the rough terrain as best she could. She ran back to the tribe's camp, crying out that the Pohono, the spirit of the evil wind, had drawn the maiden in. After hearing the old woman's story, the old chief of Awani warned all other members of his tribe to never venture into the mists of Pohono. He warned them it was the abode of an evil spirit that would draw them in and throw them over the falls to their deaths where their spirits would be carried down into Pohono's land of darkness and misery, to be held captive until Pohono secured another victim. To this day, it is told that another Awani has never ventured into the grasp of Pohono since the maiden's death, though the spirit continues to haunt Bridal Veil Fall. The Haunting of Awani Hotel The Awani Hotel in Yosemite National Park was opened in 1927. The hotel is one of the United States' most distinctive registered national landmarks. The Awani offers every comfort needed right in the hub of the Sierra mountain terrain. There are also some potentially uncomfortable amenities. There are believed to be two World War II era ghosts that haunt the mezzanine level of the hotel, which could be due to the fact that the Awani was used as a naval convalescent hospital during the war. Numerous other spirits are said to inhabit the hotel including Mary Curry Treseder, who took part in the hotel's design and opening, and none other than President John F. Kennedy. After Mary Curry Treseder aided in the design, she actually lived in a private apartment at the Iwani Hotel until her death in 1970, and is believed to be her spirit that began spooking guests on the sixth floor shortly thereafter. Since then, sightings of her ghost are frequently reported by the hotel guests and personnel. Her spirit is said to be more of a prankster than a threatening entity, as she is known for performing nurturing actions like tucking in guests as they sleep or folding their clothes they were previously strewn about. Guests have also reported having their items moved around their rooms and being called out to by Mary's ghost. U.S. President John F. Kennedy stayed on the third floor of the Iwani Hotel during a visit to Yosemite in 1962. During his stay, a rocking chair was placed in his room at the President's own request as he had complained of back pain. Kennedy reportedly spent plenty of time in the chair, rocking away the time in pain, perhaps contemplating. After his visit concluded, the rocking chair was removed from the hotel room. Since his death in 1963, there are often reports of a spectral rocking chair mysteriously appearing in the room where the president slept. The chair has even been seen moving itself about the halls and other rooms of the third floor. Various other occurrences are reported in the hotel, including the sightings of apparitions and the hearing of disembodied footsteps. It's as if the Awani Hotel, or perhaps the majestic land of Yosemite, and yet maybe a sinister resident, holds on to some visitors for good. Now, here are five unexplained disappearances from Yosemite National Park. Number five, Tom Opperman. 21-year-old Tom Opperman disappeared on August 8, 1967. Tom's last known location was Merced Lake. He was heading out to hike Clark Mountain in Yosemite. Tom's plan was after he had hiked Mount Clark, then head over to Glacier Point and return to the valley two days later on August 10. An extensive search was undertaken when Tom was reported missing, and sometime during the search, 16 U.S. Marines were brought in to help. After a week, the main search was scaled back to cover only the Merced Lake and Clark Mountain areas. Assistant Park Superintendent at the time, David Condon, said after the week-long extensive search, 
we feel the young man probably met up with some misfortune. On September 25, 1967, a three-man team set out on what would be the last searching attempt at locating Tom. Nothing was discovered on this final search attempt. As of February 8, 2021, Tom's case remains unsolved and there have been no further updates. Number four, Walter A. Gordon. 26-year-old Walter Gordon disappeared on July 20, 1954, while he was believed to be hiking up the Ledge Trail to Glacier Point. Walter was a University of California researcher, a Yosemite Park employee, and an overall experienced hiker. Walter was carrying a boxed lunch and planned to stop and eat somewhere along Ledge Trail. Former Yosemite Park Ranger John W. Bingaman recounted Walter's disappearance, along with many others, in Chapter 7 of his 1961 publication, Guardians of the Yosemite. Ranger John writes that Walter was working at Camp Curry in Yosemite, and when he was reported missing, the other rangers went out looking. He said regarding the search and rescue operation, rangers searched for many days. Bloodhounds and a helicopter were used, but no trace of him was ever found. The helicopter used in the search for Walter was one of the first ever used in the park. Despite the extensive efforts, nothing was found. Now, how did a young, agile employee of the park disappear on a hike that he likely would have taken many times previously? As of February 8, 2021, Walter's case remains unsolved and there have been no further updates. Number three, Orvar Loss. 30-year-old Orvar Loss disappeared on October 9, 1954, not even three months after Walter Gordon went missing while on a hike in the vicinity of Sugar Pine Bridge in Yosemite Valley. Orvar was from Berkeley, California, and was visiting his family in the Yosemite area at the time of his disappearance. Former park ranger John wrote about Orvar's case in Guardians of the Yosemite and said, he disappeared completely and was never found, although rangers searched for days. Ranger John also wrote in his publication about both Orvar and Walter, the previous case, saying the case of Gordon and Loss were very strange for there were no clues as to what happened to them. As of February 8, 2021, Orvar's case remains unsolved and there have been no further updates. Number two, Louis A. Miller. 73-year-old Louis Miller disappeared in September of 1950 from somewhere in the vicinity of the Mono Pass Trail, south of Tioga Pass, at the end of the old road. In his book, Gardens of the Yosemite, Ranger John recalled that he was at two alumni Meadow Ranger Station the day Lewis went missing. Lewis and his son, L.R. Miller, were fishing that day, and they had temporarily separated to fish independently. Lewis was going up Dana Fork while his son, L.R., fished downstream. They were supposed to meet back at the car around 5 p.m., but Lewis never showed up. His son quickly alerted authorities. Ranger John writes about Lewis' search and rescue. I organized a ranger search team immediately, made up of Ranger Lowry Brown and another ranger, and two members of the Miller family. We searched along the stream with lanterns until midnight with no success. Early the next morning, we got additional help from headquarters. Thirty searchers spent all day without finding a trace. We had searchers out in the area for ten days without success. Mounted rangers combed the area, but found nothing. Notices were posted on the east side of the Sierra at various points. This with the hope that if he was a victim of amnesia or made his way out on foot, someone would recognize him walking along a trailer road. Lewis disappeared without a trace, and what happened to him has remained a complete mystery to this day. Anyone with information concerning the missing man should contact his son, L.R. Miller, at 917 14th Street, Antioch, California. As of February 8, 2021, Lewis' case remains unsolved and there have been no further updates. Number 1. Emerson Holt 54-year-old Emerson Holt disappeared on July 18, 1943, more than 75 years ago now, while hiking at Yosemite National Park. Emerson was vice president of the Riverside Title Company and was well known to many villagers. 
A large search party was assembled shortly after he disappeared, but nothing was found. An article published in the San Bernardino Sun on July 24, 1943, states that Yosemite National Park officials described Emerson's disappearance as mystifying. Emerson was with a large group of friends when he went missing. They left Happy Isles heading for Lake Camp, which was seven miles away. When the group was almost to their destination, Emerson reportedly complained of a pain in his legs and had to sit and rest. He told the group that he would catch up, but they never saw him again. Emerson frequented the trails at Yosemite and was no stranger to its terrain. Even so, the area he went missing in wasn't nearly as dangerous as some other areas of the park. Park superintendent at that time, Frank Kittredge, said the group were alarmed when Emerson didn't return and the search began immediately. He also said that he and other park officials were puzzled because the Merced River where Emerson rested is shallow and not swift, and there were no cliffs or deep pools of water for several hundred yards. How did Emerson disappear without a trace, so close to his destination, with so many people around? On August 6, 1943, the search was getting more intense and was still well underway, as reported by the Desert Sun newspaper. No later digitized articles were found on Emerson Holt's disappearance, and his ultimate fate remains unknown. He would be 132 years old if he were alive today. As of February 8, 2021, Emerson's case remains unsolved, and there have been no further updates. And now, as promised, here is a bonus case. Now, this is a case with slightly different criteria than we normally cover. The disappearance was near Yosemite, and the missing person case that correlates with Jane Doe, if one exists, has not been discovered, so her identity remains unknown. This 17 to 30 year old Jane Doe's partial remains were discovered in Yosemite Summit Meadow along Glacier Point Road in 1983. Jane Doe's cause of death was human foul play, and the suspect in this case was serial killer Henry Lee Lucas, who was interviewed by authorities in 1980 and eventually died in prison in 2001. He knew facts about Jane Doe's case that were never revealed to the public and could only be known by the guilty party, so it was reasonable to believe that he was responsible for her death. Jane Doe's identity remains unknown despite the information given by Henry Lee Lucas before his death. He stated that in the early 1980s, he had picked up a female hitchhiker on Highway 41, somewhere between Fresno, California and Yosemite National Park. He said she was 5'5 five five or 5'6 five and weighed approximately 100 to 125 pounds. She had long straight hair that was light brown to blonde and wore silver rings on both her hands. Jane Doe is believed by forensic experts to have been at least in her late teens, although she could have been up to 30 years old. The National Park Service Investigative Services Branch has had special agents working with multiple labs and agencies to identify Jane Doe and bring closure to her family. A digital facial reconstruction was created by forensic artists using an anthropology exam along with a CT scan of the remains. There will be a link in the show notes corresponding with Jane Doe to read about the case and for a closer look at her facial reconstruction about three quarters of the way down the page. If you have any information that you think could help the case and ultimately help identify Jane Doe, you're urged to please call the National Park Service tip line at 888-653-0009. Now, these mysterious and unexplained disappearances have been happening probably for millennia, and they continue to happen daily, with our national parks being hotspots for these missing person cases. It is recommended that everyone who plans on being within our national parks or out in the wilderness in general carry a personal locator beacon at all times, which transmits a distress signal with its location when activated in the event that something goes wrong. While there could be any number of things or a combination of things to blame for these cases, one thing is certain. Something had to have happened. Whether these people suffered some natural tragedy or disappeared through supernatural means, they did not simply vanish though the official records would appear to be just that, vanishings. What do you think happened? Let us know in the comment section. And if we've earned your subscription, please hit the subscribe button and turn on post notifications so you don't miss out on any new content or case updates. Thank you for listening. And until we meet again, 
take care of yourselves and each other. I'm Steve Stockton, and I'll talk to you next time.